I'd like to introduce Raj Hazra. He is our High Performance Computing Vice President, General Manager. So good morning. Um, it's good to see some uh, familiar faces and, and talk to you uh, about high performance computing. Uh, now many of you may be wondering, uh, what is the HPC guy doing here as we talk about you know, big cloud service providers, data center infrastructure, how does he fit in, uh, other than the fact that I obviously missed the dress code memo for jeans under jackets? And of course, the fact that I missed my clicker. Oh. <laughs> Apparently got to pay the big data guy for it. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today um, is the fact that HPC's come a long way, and it's got a long ways and exciting ways to go. But where it's come from is from the purview of uh, national labs, national governments, people in white coats, um, to being an essential tool for the economy that we live in today, which is a knowledge economy. And essentially, the heart of that statement is rooted in, in something I can't lay claim to having come up with, but it sums it up very well. To compete, you must compute. Whether you're a nation competing for in the world of economy or political fields for national security, you must compute. Whether you're business trying to get ahead, trying to be more competitive, trying to be more efficient, trying to be more innovative, you have to compute. And whether it's us, each as individuals, as human beings that want a better quality of life, a better social experience, a better professional experience, we either benefit from or contribute to that computation. So in essence, because irrespective of who you are, to compete, you must compute. High-performance computing has become an essential tool for the world today, and there's no going back. So with that, what will you hear from me today? There's really three things um, following along the pattern of three things that you will hear from, that you will hear from me today. One is, of course, continuing on this theme that it has become a fundamental capability, and that fundamental capability is not just in its existing and traditional domain of driving you know, science and research, but it's also driving business transformation and expanding into new areas. So stay tuned, uh, Anil, on new usage models benefiting from high-performance computing. So we'll touch on that. Second... I'll talk about how HPC is going to need unprecedented levels of innovation going forward. Many, some, I would say, have either claimed that the wonderful days of beautiful innovation and the state-of-the-art first-ever serial number one things in HPC are over. Um, to use a word uh, you heard earlier today, HPC may have become boring. It's all about Beowulf scale-out clusters. Just get more money and build bigger and just have make sure you have a nuclear power plant sitting next to you. Well, it's clearly not that. And as, as it becomes more of a fundamental tool, there's going to be tremendous amounts of innovation needed. And I'll talk about both where those challenges are and what Intel's doing about it. The third then gets into our view of how we both drive that innovation internally and in partnership with the rest of the ecosystem. And in particular, how we bridge between hardware, software, the broader ecosystem needs, and increasingly getting engaged at the public policy levels that have become quite a fundamental mover in terms of either accelerating this change or inhibiting it. So those are the three things. It's a fundamental capability, more fundamental than it's ever been. Uh, it's an exciting hotbed of innovation. It is both transforming itself and helping transform things. And you'll get a very good insight, hopefully, of the depth and breadth of Intel's investment in this area in partnership with the ecosystem. So let's talk a little bit about fundamentals. I stated it was fundamental to discovery and insight. Well, obviously, that has been where HPC has been for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, the fundamental discoveries in science. You know, on the left-hand side is the picture of the Large Hadron Collider uh, at CERN and uh, of recent you know, news 
is the discovery of some fundamental advancements and, uh, and insights into particle physics, most importantly the Higgs boson. In the middle is a complete global climate uh, model running and creating a view of not just how the world has evolved over the last 30 or 40 years that we've had data, but more importantly, how it might evolve if some of those trends change. Um, many of you will recognize this is the, the, the life between La Nina and El Nino. <laughs> the third, you could stop at these two and say, well understood problems, the total size of these problems and the appetite for going after learning insight into these problems is pretty much done. So Raj, what are you talking about in terms of growth? The one on the right is an one example of a new area of fundamental insight that multiple nations, in particular the US and Europe, are looking into. That is basically the next step to understanding how fundamentally the human brain works. Many people have claimed, and perhaps correctly so, that it is the ultimate supercomputer in the world. Right? Even mine, um, and I won't go into my SAT scores. Um, and it is not just a passive intellectual curiosity. It is where governments are focused on. Um, the President of the United States announced a hundred million dollar startup effort look at what is essentially the US Brain Project. And it brings together an interesting collection of interdisciplinary folks to go look at how to model and gain insight from the working of human brain. Um, the Europeans actually have been somewhat a little bit more bolder saying that this journey takes 10 years and a billion dollars, and are basing some of the work on exascale computing on using this as a canonical proxy problem. Fundamentally, HPC is the tool for unlocking the mysteries of our universe, and there are many, many, many of them still left to be solved. So this is going to continue to drive. Let's look at something a little bit beyond just big science and big research. Transforming business, the world uh, that you know, is driving this knowledge economy. On the left, you see a little bit of a, uh, of a pie chart, if you will, and many of these things will look familiar to you, you know, whether it's drug discovery or designing on a computer, uh, the next airplane, or doing financial services in terms of modeling to figure out um, various kinds of interesting activities. Um, and even understanding uh, where our next sources of energy may be, another critical, um, you know, not just a national scale, but a global scale problem. So I won't go into those. I will go into one that I recently um, discovered and talked about at ISC, uh, which really from, you know, from the perspective of why I was excited, and not just because I'm a car buff, is the fact that it, it was transformative. How was it transformative? It took vision to reality without prototypes. So if you know anything and have looked into the car industry, um, the notion of concept cars, building full-scale prototypes, testing them for both aesthetics and functionality has been well established. Well, it's costly, uh, it's error prone, and much like uh, infrastructure that has to be much more agile and efficient, it is not the right prototyping infrastructure for the world we live in today. So what working with Autodesk, what Audi did was essentially design an entire A8 on the computer. Right? Yes, this has been done in, to a certain extent by, by um, companies that build very, very large and expensive airplanes. But for the first time, this was done to build out a particular car model. Um, the uh, vice president of R&D and product development uh, was telling me that in general they build anywhere into the tens of prototypes at different scale. And the cost of therefore a concept car, because I looked at the beautiful car and I said I want to buy that, as he said you can't afford it. Uh, well, now Audi does this on a cluster, a standard Intel Xeon based cluster. Uh, they can not only do it in order to verify the design, but they are extending and thinking about potential new usage models, things that it transforms and enables in their business. How would you like to then go personalize a car, which is not just what color of uh, 
upholstery and what you know, uh, external color you need and whether you need feature A or B, you can actually, like an artist, paint your car, design the, the trim, right? That is the level of personalization that essentially going from big honking prototypes to, to digital putty, which is really what HPC is, allows you to do. And they are not the first, perhaps, but certainly not the last. That phenomenon is here to stay. The mantra is we need to build better products, we need to build more products quickly, and we have to build them faster and much more efficiently. So if, if the clarion call from a business in this knowledge economy is better and more, faster and cheaper, then HPC has become quite a fundamental tool. Let's talk a little bit about that third area. If you said the first two, I get it. Science and, and businesses using modeling and simulation. Let me address the new frontiers of HPC. Where is HPC bringing in new workloads? If you look at this, and, and, and I won't go into all of the myriad of wonderful examples that Ron and uh, Jason have already talked about in terms of things you could do with big data. Uh, this is really a moniker for big data. Um, but I'm going to tell you why HPC is relevant. Hopefully, Anil, I'm going to answer your question. If you look at traditional HPC, it has always been about taking an observation to postulate from postulate to a physical law. If you're doing uh, design, you're solving Navier-Stokes equation. If you're doing a piece of materials research, you're solving some kind of a physical equation and, you know, equating several variables of nature. Um, and then, once you have that model, once you have those relationships that bound behavior and context, you say, what ifs? What if I change the plane's wing a little bit? You know, what breaks? Well, what if you don't have any models to start with? What if uh, those models are transient and only make sense in the context of a particular task? Yet, you have to make that, uh, that analysis very quick. You have to do it with vast amounts of data. And you have to do that without absolute knowledge of that data being accurate or even cor you know, um, correct and authentic. So what HPC is doing is getting closer to big data or in certain audiences, I would say big data is getting close to HPC. What it's doing essentially is not modifying per se what HPC does once you have a model built or a set of relationships built like a graph. It is being used as a tool in that essential first step of building that model. Maybe it is a transient model. Maybe it's a closed form model. Maybe it's a graph or a relationship express model. But from a myriad of data sources coming up with what is the relationship and maintaining multiple versions of it, each for a different context of the solution, and then doing so in such a way that it can be mined effectively. Questions can be asked. It can be used for decision support down the line. That is essentially what HPC is extending to in the world of big data. So in many ways, and people can call me a little bit conceited for being the HPC guy, it is what's transforming data into knowledge. It is the fundamental infrastructure that is taking the ability to take this mass of unutilized assets and solving a set of problems in a structured approach. This is the new frontier. It is a little unfortunate that the community has either gotten a little confused or politicized the big data versus HPC debate. You certainly have read some of that coming out of certain uh, policy papers. But the reality is they are very, very complementary. In a nutshell, big data applications provide a new set and an expanded set of workloads for HPC to address. And, and those workloads are driving some interesting changes in the way we build HPC for the future as well. So, Anil, did I answer your question? If not, you can tell me later I did or not. So let's, let's go into then, what, what are we doing about it? What is Intel doing about it, right? We have obviously enjoyed the benefits of both the partnerships as well as our R&D 
to get not only smarter, but get better at the business of HPC. If you look at the chart on the left, the top 10, top 500 systems have the total number of systems, of course, is 10 and 500, but the total flops have improved and have grown significantly. Now, some of that is because of the innovations around what I would call performance density, simply architectures that deliver per watt or per unit area higher and higher performance. But some of it is also, if you go back and look at the top 500 over the last five to seven years, is simply systems getting larger. There is some data from IDC that says even though system growth, the number of systems, that CAGR has been in the single digits, in the two to three to four percent, processor unit growth has actually been significantly larger, close to eight to nine percent. And what that means is as you have more systems, each system has more processors in, in order to serve that compute capability. And in that time frame, we have gained market segment share with the products that we've built using and enabling an open standard ecosystem based on those products from 68.5% in 2003 to uh, about 84% as we exited Q1 of 2013. Uh, and that's a statement not in the top 500, that's across the entire space of HPC. So we obviously think um, that this is not just the final hurrah, but this is the beginning of the next era. So let's talk a little bit about the next era. Before we do that, um, and to understand what's, what we see as happening in the next era, let's take a look a little bit of a history lesson, because history teaches us a little bit of what happened and why, and maybe that's insightful, maybe not as insightful as big data, Ron, but insightful in deciding what might happen in the future. So circa 2003, how many of you um, were tr following or tracking HPC or Top 500 in 2003? All right. So who do you think uh, had the number one position in Top 500? Everybody's Googling furiously now. It was the Earth Simulator in Japan. But more importantly, if you look at what was then considered the supreme domain of high-performance computing, the top 500 systems of the world. I've listed every architecture and then underneath usually the companies that served or brought those architectures into products. You had MIPS from SGI, obviously IBM was there with PowerPC, HP had RISC, Itanium were multiple um, OEMs at least. Vector was then the big uh, scientific computing engine. There was Cray's version and NEC's version. And of course, there was the big risk machines like uh, Spark and Alpha. And Intel was 20% of the top 500. So let's fast forward a little bit to uh, 2013, right? Um, as we came out of ISC, um, our overall HPC MSS is 84%, as I just said. And 80% of the top 500 machines now run on Intel architecture. What's perhaps more interesting and rewarding for us from an ecosystem perspective is to look at the number of our OEM partners that have adopted this architecture and made this the flagship of their HPC efforts, right? As you can see, Cray no longer does um, a vector architecture, right? Cray is now an x86 partner. Uh, and similarly uh, in other areas like SGI as well. So this, in some sense, is the power of what Diane and Jason were talking about earlier today. The power of open, standards-based, ecosystem-friendly, and driven architectural innovation. So where do we go from here? What we are viscerally focused on is understanding diverging needs. I shouldn't say diverging, I should say diverse needs of both our customers, our OEMs, as well as end users who are their customers. As I just mentioned, you know, with, with the number of things that HPC is going to be central and fundamental to, the number of workloads, as Diane mentioned again this morning, is going to be more diversified than ever before. The deployment scenarios and workflows are going to be more diverse as well. The constraints around TCO are going to be more stringent and as well. So at Intel, 
our basic philosophy is then listen to our customers, listen to our customers' customers, and work together in order to build the right solutions uh, that serve both the end user needs, but make it a viable, long-term, sustainable business proposition for the ecosystem to, to continue to deliver. The core of this is hardware building blocks. Obviously, we have you know, our general purpose CPU line, or which we've called the Xeon processor, and you've seen kind of the success of that in my uh, data leading up to this point. We've recently introduced the Xeon Phi coprocessor. We'll talk about that a little bit in a second as well as interconnect or fabrics, which are increasingly becoming a central point of innovation um, for large-scale system design. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. In addition, we continue to invest in software building blocks, not just in standards and open source, but also providing for the ecosystem um, and in order to facilitate their deployment of solutions, products such as cluster-ready um, programming tools like Silk Plus uh, to make a broader proliferation of the use of HPC happen. In addition, we augment that with systems. Not only do we, do we have what we call traditionally enabling activities as we bring leading-edge solutions to the marketplace to ensure that our partners in the ecosystem are ready to take that into solution to ensure that new memory technologies or I.O. technologies are not gated. Um, the benefit of those, unleashing the benefit of those is not gated by someone not being ready. We, we do a tremendous amount of enabling in partnership with the ecosystem. And we also have very specific system level solutions for certain sections of the market and our partners who seek that capability in order to build and amplify their business, such as in rack optimized servers, uh, RAID solutions, as well as increasingly software and services like Intel Manageability uh, Service, which helps deployment of these capability. Finally, we work very closely uh, with end customers. POCs, as increasingly the workflow is changing, how HPC is not just being built, but how HPC is being delivered to a multitude of customers, whether it's through a cloud-based delivery model, whether it's through a different delivery model and a business model, we are working with a large number of end customers around the world to understand, number one, what works, and number two, then, what would make it work better. Let's talk a little bit about one of the fundamental crossroads that the industry is at today in terms of compute, which we called uh, this notion of heterogeneous computing. Um, the first thing is, heterogeneity is here to stay, right? Uh, this goes back to the comments Diane made earlier today. It's certainly true in the broader data center. It's absolutely true in the stringent world of Amdahl that HPC lives in. There are codes that are highly parallel, to there are codes that are still very, very serial in nature and everything in between. And we can no longer afford to build one arc, just one global design point and say everything runs on it just as well because it doesn't, it's inefficient. And so heterogeneity, which allows you to target design points in an architecture to whether the codes are very, very serial or highly parallel, is an absolute necessity. The problem is it has been hard. It has been hard not just to design, but it has primarily been hard to use, and that inhibits ecosystem acceptance and acceleration of the benefits of those technologies. If you look at this IDC study, what I've got circled in red, I apologize if it's hard to read, is in a short matter of two years, people went from about 25% of uh, a survey respondents saying, uh, we don't think uh, we get this heterogeneity thing and maybe too hard and we don't intend to use it, to 75% saying they will need to find a way to use it. This is just, again, a testament that Amdahl is reality and that one-size-fits-all can no, no longer be the solution in a world looking for efficiency. But it has been hard. What we have, and this is our belief, is that to serve heterogeneity best, to implement that heterogeneity in an ecosystem and end-user friendly model, you have to do it keeping in mind the programming complexity of any architecture. And so as we've talked about, as we introduced 
researched and then introduced a product on our many core architecture, which we call Xeon Phi. We can design silicon to take care or to target various design points of efficiency, power efficiency, performance, serial, and parallel. But we do that under a single IA-based programming model. That is whether you're programming a multi-core or a many-core or a cluster of these things, sometimes heterogeneous, from a tools perspective and from an ecosystem you know, developer perspective, you try to maintain as much of not just the coding paradigms, if not the code itself, but also the knowledge needed in order to continue to take these applications to the next level of scale performance, which in itself is quite a hard task. Well, are we succeeding? Right? Uh, I see Edison sitting here. Um, two interesting studies here, uh, Intersect 360 and IDC. They polled uh, several hundred end users on their prospective buys in the future. What would you buy? Um, IDC came out with 32% in terms of a coprocessor. Uh, IDC came out with a 32% Intel uh, preference and 26% NVIDIA preference. Um, Intersect 360 has a little bit more runway here. You know, if you look at their 2011 result, NVIDIA's GP GPU technology was 90%. And given that we had just started, quote unquote, sampling our software delivery vehicles, we were at 36%. In 2012, um, I think going from 36 to 70% simply in the year that the product was defined is stunning. It's stunning because what it did, what Xeon Phi and this philosophy of neo-heterogeneity does, is says, I understand the end user's real pain point, which is not around acquiring heterogeneous technology, but making the most efficient use of it in a constrained world. The next thing I want to talk about then is fabrics. You know, we at Intel, many have said as a processor company, although for many years we've sold and, and innovated around interconnect technologies uh, and networking technologies in particular. The way HPC has worked till today is you have a processor uh, because of the scaled nature of an HPC system. You then connect all of these processors through what's called the interconnection network or either the fabric. It's InfiniBand, MirrorNet, Ethernet, or even custom fabrics that come from companies like Cray. And what you have, what we've seen is the more the number of chips you have, the higher cost, the lower the density. If you look at Jason's design and he asks himself how cool would it be to the reduce the number of quote-unquote network controllers and therefore have a highly dense design and more chip crossings as you go between the processor fabric controller and out on the network is simply higher power. That's the law of physics. So the, more ch the less chips you have, you will reduce cost through integration. You will enable more dense designs and more s perhaps most importantly, be able to lower the overall power in the system. If you look at really large scale top 10 class systems in the world, the network itself the network itself is 20 to 30% of the total power in the system, right? And that clearly is, if not dealt with in a co-designed manner with the rest of the system, is going to inhibit the ability to build larger and larger cap capacity, compute capacity in the future. So what's our view? I know, they're honking for it. So our view is integration is a, is the next big key change. Uh, as you've probably seen, um, we've acquired uh, Cray's Fabric IP. It's a very high performance supercomputing fabric. We've acquired um, Fulcrum and the InfiniBand business of QLogic to give us a top to bottom capability in interconnection technologies for scale systems, both in hardware and software. And with that, what we are going to do uh, in the second half of the decade is build processors, take the advantage that we have, the capability of Moore's Law, the, the densest, most inexpensive transistors in the world, and do exactly what I just said. Fewer chips, lower the cost, increase performance and density, and most importantly, lower power. That is the path that we are on. And integration is the game changer. It's a game changer, it's transformative, and it continues to sp 
drive the innovation spiral. Think today, uh, as someone came and approached me and asked me about what fabric integration could do, could probably had a future site. Think of uh, Diane's earlier comments about making everything more flexible and therefore more software defined. Integration into or closer to processing lets us do that. It lets us disaggregate layers in what's called the network stack and make things more flexible where they can be defined for behavior uh, based on an application's needs. So we are very excited about this. We believe we have the assets, and we are aggressively working to bring this uh, to, to the world in, in our roadmap. We haven't forgotten software. Again, circa 2003, we had a math kernel library for those that wanted to write FFTs and GMMs, right? Uh, we had a compiler suite, uh, partly because uh, people told us that they got good performance when they used Intel compilers, and this was before GCC really hit it on. And then we had performance analyzers fairly um, targeted at the architectures and their uh, visibility points or ports of that day. Well, from, from having a business in just processors for HPC to having more of a systems view means we have certainly broadened our view of what it takes to have the right software presence and support for the ecosystem. Our tools, if you noticed, have gone, have extended beyond simple libraries and compilers to cluster level tools where you can check whether a cluster is performing to a sp particular set of specifications. A huge, huge asset from a TCO and, and efficiency in deploying scale solutions. Uh, Ron talked quite a bit about Hadoop and Lustre, so I won't go into those, but those are, again, capabilities in the system software or the basic middleware layer that we can now use to both optimize for the kinds of benefits that he talked about, as well as keep as an engine for further innovation as the system architecture transforms. Driving innovation and integration is nothing new. For, for us, uh, I went back and looked at our history, and it was probably the hardest thing was just making sure that the dates were right. Um, we've, we've done this integration and, and innovation on, almost on a continuous step. You know, math eight, uh, 1989 was the math coprocessor, the 87 family. Um, 2008 was memory controller, graphics, which is now ubiquitous. Uh, in Sandy Bridge in 2011, we had PCI Express I.O. controller, uh, and very recently, about a month ago, I announced at ISC that we would, in the night's landing, the next generation of the Xeon FICO processor, that we would integrate in package memory. Okay, so integration is underway, and it's accelerating. As we look into the future, I talked about fabric integration, Many people have hinted at the possibility of driving more intelligence to drive storage, especially as storage and memory hierarchies either converge or align. Uh, certainly building switches um, to do intelligent routing in very high-scale density systems. And then the fundamental unit of compute uh, around three-dimensionality, extending it beyond where it is today in terms of just 3D stacked memory, beyond that into memory and processors. This is all an active research. We seek a clear path to doing this, again, because we have the capability in Moore's Law and the ability to co-design with the knowledge of what that process technology and trans transistors are going to be able to do inside of Intel. So system-level benefits and cost, power, density, scalability, and performance. The, the verdict, the rationale for this integration is actually pretty clear. So I'll leave you with one thought. Many people have asked me, what is really the value of HPC? Yes, I, I hear about solving the human brain or transforming a few things, but does it have an endearing and a transformative value beyond, of supercomputing in particular? Many of, in many circles, we've talked about exascale in 20 megawatts. Right? I can see Edison smiling already. Right? It is the next big mantra. Right? This is where the community is striving to get to by the end of the decade. Yes, and we will have probably two, three, four, five systems. Not 50, not 500, not 5,000. 
such systems by 2021, 2022. But what I'm really excited about is if we can build that technology and scale it effectively, we could have a petaflop system, a top 10 class system of today in the rack right behind me, consuming no more than 20 kilowatts of power. We tend to think that that's a tremendous democratizing effect on HPC, bringing in many more users who are no longer constrained by this tremendous TCO barrier of the future. But do we just stop there? The technologies that we build in order to make this reality can be extended. You can now see why stop at um, a petaflop in 20 kilowatts using some of the same architectural techniques and married with silicon techniques and design techniques, you can get a teraflop in 20 watts. Think of what you could do with a large professional style tablet uh, with a teraflop of compute for visualization. Well, extend further, in two watts you get 100 gigaflops something, handheld idea. It's waiting for our next big idea because it's been unleashed uh, by this 100x performance of today's phone at the same power. And then for those in the Internet of Things, certainly, what could you do with a gigaflop in 20 milliwatt? Could you fundamentally re-architect the end-to-end -end analytics hierarchy run, right? So as we look at the benefits of supercomputing and the pursuit of supercomputing, not just in HPC but beyond, we see a tremendous role for this pursuit of ours helping sponsor tomorrow. Why is that phrase... Uh, particular of any particular value here because that is our mantra that is what we aspire to do at intel is to sponsor tomorrow right with that i'll leave you with the three things i said first hpc is transforming the world of data and information into knowledge knowledge is the next big equity and we believe hpc continuing to grow is a fairly certain outcome of that we at Intel are no longer just building CPUs. We're taking a systems view, and we are innovating across the board at a system level and partnering at a system level with the ecosystem. And we are very confident that this decade, as we look at Exascale, we will create and extend computing technology, sponsor tomorrow by taking not just HPC, to touch the lives of everybody or its effort, but the benefits of technological innovation, the waterfall, to create products, services, and capabilities we can only dream about today. Thank you very much. <laughs>